Armstrong, and this is VOA One, the hits. I wish I knew. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Dan Friedel has a story on difficult to say names in the news in 2022. Katie Weaver and Mario Ritter Jr. report on how the world handled COVID this year. Later, we present our American History series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Do you know about the Otani Rule? Have you seen a movie with actor Donald Gleason? If you are a fan of Japanese baseball player Shohei Otani or Irish actor Donald Gleason, you likely know how to say their names. Both men were in the news in 2022. Otani got attention in the spring, because America's Professional Baseball League introduced a rule change that many call the Otani Rule. They call it that because of his special skills. And in October, Donald Gleason jokingly called out television show host Stephen Colbert for saying his first name wrong. The right way to say it is Donal. In fact, their names are among the most mispronounced names of 2022. That information comes from the captioning group. The company puts real-time words under live news stories in the U.S. and Canada. The group has released a most mispronounced list every year since 2016. This year's list includes names like the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia and Negroni Spagliato, an Italian alcoholic drink. Zaporizhia is the city that is home to the world's largest nuclear power plant. Serious fighting between Russia and Ukraine took place in the area earlier this year. Russian soldiers took control of the power center. It was shut down in the autumn to avoid a major accident. People often worry about mispronouncing a foreign name. But one expert, Esteban Tuma, says it is a good thing that we live in a world where we hear and see new names and sounds. Tuma is a producer and teacher for the language learning company Babbel. He said, seeing all the difficult names in the news really shows the ways we interact with other languages and really gives a good grasp of what's going on in the world and how we connect with people abroad. Even people who have help sometimes make mistakes, including U.S. President Joe Biden. He had trouble saying the name of Great Britain's new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Biden said Rashid Sanuk. Another famous person, the singer Adele, recently said her fans have been saying her name incorrectly for many years. She said her name should sound like Adele. Of course, many fans said that is just how people with a British accent pronounce it. Other mispronounced names in the news include athletes Tua Tungavailoa, the American football player, and tennis star Novak Djokovic. Tonga Vailoa was talked about because of a serious head injury he suffered during a game. Djokovic was in the news early in 2022 because he arrived in Australia to play in a competition, 
but was not permitted to play because he was not vaccinated against COVID-19. In the world of science, many people talked about a large crater in the Gulf of Mexico. It is called Chicxulub. Some say the crater was caused by an asteroid that led to the disappearance of dinosaurs. And many people learned the correct way to say the capital city of Scotland during televised memorial services for Britain's Queen Elizabeth II. Many people say Edinburgh, but locals say Edinburgh. After two years of pandemic emergency, could 2022 be the year the world finally learned to live with COVID-19? From Asia to Africa, countries reopened for business and visitors following developments in COVID-19 vaccination and treatment. On New Year's Day, Portugal's president, Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, announced the easing of COVID-19 restrictions. He said his country had moved into the endemic period of the pandemic. Endemic means a disease has settled in a place for years to come. Britain's Prime Minister at the time, Boris Johnson, took similar action later that month. Announcing an end to requirements for face coverings, he said, We will trust the judgment of the British people and no longer criminalize anyone who chooses not to wear one. The moves were the start of reopening borders to members of the European Union and then to vaccinated travelers from around the world. Australian officials, however, denied entry to Novak Djokovic, the world's top tennis player, in January. The country's health officials ruled that Djokovic failed to meet the country's vaccination requirement. The World Health Organization, WHO, added in January that countries could consider easing COVID rules if they had high vaccination rates and strong health care systems. In June, South Africa lifted its COVID restrictions. Visitors can come and go without vaccination papers or testing. Other African countries, including Madagascar, Egypt, and Botswana, soon followed. Many Asian countries opened back up in 2022 as well. Thailand, Vietnam, India, Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia all eased restrictions and welcomed visitors. China was the last major country with severe COVID restrictions remaining. During the 2022 Beijing Olympics, it locked down millions of its people and isolated visitors in restricted areas. The zero-COVID policy led to rare protests in several cities after at least 10 people died in a building fire in the western city of Urumqi last month. Reports of the fire led to angry questions about whether firefighters or victims trying to escape were blocked as a result of antivirus measures. A week later, China announced that it would ease some restrictions and step up a vaccination campaign. Experts expected China to reopen sometime next year. In the State of the Union speech to Congress in March, 
American President Joe Biden said last year COVID-19 kept us apart. This year we are finally together again. He noted that the gathering did not require face coverings. That was possible, he said, in his speech, because of the progress in vaccine and antiviral treatment efforts. As the Omicron version of the virus was quickly spreading around the world, United States health officials approved the first drug against COVID-19 that could be taken at home. The drug, Paxlovid, is a pill made by the U.S. drug company Pfizer. All the earlier approved drugs against COVID require injection directly into the blood by healthcare professionals. Pfizer made Paxlovid available at low prices to the poorest countries. Dr. Gregory Poland of the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota spoke about Paxlovid at the time. He said, You're looking at a 90% decreased risk of hospitalization and death in a high-risk group. The high-risk group includes older people and those with conditions like being severely overweight or having heart disease. In August, U.S. health officials approved new vaccines made by Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna. The new shots are called bivalent. They are designed to protect against both the earliest and newer versions of Omicron, called BA4 and BA5. The approval of the updated vaccines is the first step toward dealing with COVID-19 vaccine updates in the same way as yearly flu shots. In this case, health officials ordered vaccine makers to make changes and to target the latest coronavirus versions without depending on human testing. The U.S. was not the only country with plans to update COVID-19 vaccines. Health officials in Britain and other European countries also offered bivalent shots to target different versions of the virus. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. We just heard Katie and Mario present this week's health report. They explored how the world dealt with COVID-19 this year. Now, Katie joins me to talk a little more about the subject. Hi, Katie. Hey there, Dan. Happy holidays. You too. And that leads me right to a question. The holidays mean traveling and gathering in groups for many people. Are you among them? Well, I do not have to travel this year. I have family coming to visit from New York City, however. Do you worry that they might bring COVID-19? We have all tried to minimize risk by staying home as much as possible the last week. And when we do go out in public, we mask up. Of course, we will all test for COVID before we get together as well. Hmm. So how many people are you expecting? Twelve in all, but there will be other beings present as well. What does that mean? Well, everyone is bringing their pets. We will host twelve people, four dogs, two cats, and a guinea pig. <laughs> wow. Well, we just have two cats, but... Katie, best wishes for good health and holiday fun to the family. Thanks, Dan. Enjoyed chatting with you.
Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Two summers had gone by since the start of the American Civil War, and the North had not yet won a major battle in Virginia. The Army of the Potomac, the strongest of the Union armies, had tried to seize Richmond, the Confederate capital. General George McClellan moved the army up to the very gates of the city, but then General Robert E. Lee led his southern forces in a fierce attack. It smashed McClellan's army and drove them away from Richmond. Morris Joyce and Jack Moyles continue the story of the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln and his new Chief General Henry Halleck put together a new Northern force. They called it the Army of Virginia. They gave command of it to General John Pope, a successful fighter in the West. Pope began to move south toward Richmond. Halleck ordered McClellan to bring his army up to join Pope. Together, they could smash through the Confederate defenses around Richmond. Lee decided to hit Pope before McClellan could join him. He left a few thousand troops to guard Richmond, then took the rest north. Lee moved up to the Rappahannock River, across from Pope's army. Lee sent Stonewall Jackson with 24,000 men on a quick march around the western end of Pope's lines. Jackson and his men marched more than 80 kilometers in two days. They got behind Pope and seized a huge northern supply center at Manassas. Pope moved to smash them. They burned the captured supplies... Then they moved a few kilometers away to a long, low hill just northwest of the Bull Run battleground where southern forces defeated a northern army a year before. Jackson hid his troops in woods along the hill and waited for General Lee to arrive with the rest of the southern army. But before Lee could get there... Union troops, thousands of them, marched down the road below Jackson. Jackson decided to attack, to hold them there until Lee arrived with help. The fighting was furious. Neither side broke. The fighting died down at the end of the day, and Jackson's men moved back to their positions on higher ground. They made their lines along a partly built railroad on the side of the hill. From his headquarters on the hill, Jackson watched the northern forces prepare for battle. Many thousands of the enemy were marching into position. Pope brought up all his soldiers, and others were on the way from bases near Washington. Several thousand of McClellan's troops commanded by General Porter, were arriving from the south. It was a mighty force, much larger than Jackson's army. Jackson was worried. He sent an officer back to find General Lee. He sent a message... Lee must hurry. Jackson faced a big army. Pope's army was large, but it was poorly organized. The men had been rushed into position. The order to attack was given before all the troops were ready. So the attack began slowly, 
and Jackson was able to fight it off. But then more and more northern soldiers joined the fight. The two sides struggled for hours in the hot summer sun. Jackson's men almost broke. Men prayed for the long day to end. The sun seemed to stand still. Finally, the sun went down, and the battlefield became dark. Jackson's men had held, but they paid a terrible price. Thousands were killed or wounded. Northern losses were even greater. Most of the Union troops had fought bravely. They had hit the Confederate lines time after time. But one large group of soldiers did not get into the battle at all that day. This was the group from McClellan's Army of the Potomac, led by Fitz John Porter. Pope had ordered Porter to strike at the right end of Jackson's lines. Porter took his troops several kilometers past Jackson's right and stopped them. His soldiers remained there all day, out of the battle. Porter said later, he believed the Confederate forces were too strong for his men. Other groups of McClellan's men were arriving in Alexandria, 30 kilometers to the east. Pope asked that they be sent to help him. McClellan was ordered to send them immediately, but he refused to do so. He said they were not in condition to fight, and he would not send them. General Pope still thought he was facing only Jackson's army. He refused to believe reports that Lee had arrived on the battlefield with 30,000 more southern soldiers. Pope thought Lee was still far to the west of Manassas. Pope knew that Jackson's army had taken a terrible beating in the two days of bloody fighting, and he was sure that Jackson would try to withdraw the next day to retreat to the west. Pope divided his forces that night. He left thousands in place in front of Jackson's lines. The others were moved back. They were ordered to get ready for a march west, to block Jackson's retreat. Pope made a terrible mistake. Jackson was not planning to retreat. He was waiting with Lee to smash the Northern Army. And that is what happened the next day. Northern troops attacked Jackson's lines. The fighting was bitter. Pope's forces almost smashed through. But then Lee ordered his men to move forward to help Jackson. Confederate artillery broke up the northern attack. When the northern troops began to retreat, Lee and Jackson attacked with all their might. Many of Pope's men were not prepared for battle. They were standing together in groups, ready for marching. They could not stop the southern attack. The Confederates pushed Pope's army back across the old Bull Run battlefield. Near the end of the day, northern forces succeeded in organizing a stronger defensive line. The southern attack slowed down, then stopped. Lee sent Jackson around the north end of Pope's line to try to stop the northern retreat. 
Lee did not want the defeated Union army to escape. He wanted to destroy it. But heavy rain held up Jackson's troops. They were discovered and attacked by a strong northern force. Jackson could move no farther. He could not stop Pope's retreat to Centerville and Washington. The northern army escaped. But it left behind thousands and thousands of dead and wounded. Confederate doctors treated their own men, then tried to help the wounded soldiers of the other side. General Lee permitted northern medical wagons to return to the battlefield, and they began to carry the wounded back to Centerville. Groups of McClellan's army arriving from Alexandria met Pope's men in Centerville. They laughed and shouted at the tired, beaten soldiers. Many said they were glad that Pope had lost. One of McClellan's generals, Samuel Sturgis, greeted Pope at Centerville. I always told you, Pope, that if they gave you enough rope, you would hang yourself. What happened at Bull Run created bitter anger among the people of the North, anger against their military leaders. People felt that a year had been wasted, that thousands had died for no real purpose. The year before, southern troops sent a northern army fleeing from Bull Run. Now it was happening again. The Army of the Potomac was back where it started. As the facts of the battle became known, cries of anger became even louder. The people demanded answers. Why did McClellan and his men move so slowly? Why did they refuse to go to Pope's aid? Why did Pope let Jackson get behind him? Why were 14,000 soldiers lost? Most members of Lincoln's cabinet believed McClellan was responsible. Treasury Secretary Chase said McClellan should be shot. War Secretary Stanton said he should be dismissed immediately. He and three other cabinet members signed a note demanding that Lincoln remove McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Lincoln agreed that what McClellan had done was shocking. He said it was clear that McClellan wanted Pope to fail, but Lincoln said he would not remove McClellan. He said he knew that McClellan was not an aggressive general, but he said McClellan was a good organizer who could build the defeated army into a strong force. General Robert E. Lee, however, would not wait while McClellan rebuilt the army. He decided to carry the war to the north. And that's our program for today. 